I have 60 days, if I'm to finish before Christmas, to walk the length of the Texas-Mexico border from El Paso to Brownsville. That's over a thousand miles. After 20 years as a naturalist at the same job with retirement only five years away, I tendered a letter of resignation and planned to walk that many people thought I would not survive. I had taken on so many responsibilities at work that I went from enjoying my career to hating life. My father had been there before me. He worked on the railroad for decades with only a few years left to reach full retirement until he couldn't take it anymore and had a nervous breakdown. Dad worked through his issues in a hospital. I'll work through mine on the border. In the coming weeks, there will be hundreds of hours of solo trek time to experience a new world and to figure out my place in the one I left behind. This symbolic idea of the threatened border has become a way of expressing anxiety because of rapid, highly uncertain change in the world. It's we live in an era of economic and political and also demographic anxieties and the border kind of captures all that negative energy, unfortunately, because it's not a very negative place at all. It's actually growing, it's culturally rich, it's dynamic, it's a place sort of where a lot of the Latino future is emerging. And so it's ironic that it's uh, capturing all this anxiety, but maybe it is not totally strange because maybe it is anxiety about the future. So those of us who are here kind of feel like we're on the road toward this culturally rich and economically vibrant future and other people are anxious about that same change. I grew up in Fort Hancock and it's a very small town, but I was separated from the community. I live in a small farm so it was just me and my family. It was just my, my dad, my mom, my brother, and my sister. My grandpa started our farm with my dad's two brothers. They used to work in the onion fields in Deming, New Mexico, and they could have started a farm over there where there was plenty of water and the land was great, but um, no, they decided they wanted to go to Fort Hancock. Right now, the situation is real hard for farmers around here because there's no water. And especially for our farm, since it's a small farm, we don't have enough uh, money sometimes for, to pay for the water. We would plant a few acres of cotton and it went real well one year. But then the following year, I believe it was in 2013, when there was no water to irrigate. So my dad said, well, we have to find another solution. We have to do something else. So my dad um, decided to go into goat farming. Along the border, there is a lot of um, border security, especially in our town because it's so close to the border. To me, it feels like they're always there. They're always there to protect us, but sometimes it just goes overboard when they just stop any car that goes by and you feel like it's kind of a discrimination or or you're you're being separated for being a mexican there in our town for being hispanic latino uh, they judge you just by your looks so they stop you for that for that reason and i think that's one of the main things that is hurtful to anyone that is stopped by the Border Patrol. One afternoon, me and my mom were walking down the street and the Border Patrol zooms past us in their vehicle. And we're like, oh, okay, we didn't get stopped this time. So we, we continue walking and chatting. And then the Border Patrol comes back around and then they ask us, oh, what are you doing? Um, where are you from? Where are you walking to? Since we're Hispanics, that's the reason they stop this. Because many times they'll see like any like um, Caucasian person or they would just let them go because they wouldn't think that they would be crossing the border. But as a Hispanic, they will stop you and they will ask you questions. I think the fence, it's like blocking us from making friends 
along the border. It's segregating um, the town that lives across from Fort Hancock, which is Porvenir. And it's just sad to see that separation because it's, it, it doesn't do anything. It's just there showing and signifying the, the separation of the two countries. And it's not even finished. It stops like right there. So what's the point of it if it's not going to go across? And I don't think it's necessary for that fence to be there. Many people that don't live in the border think that there's like a big issue, like a big war going on. They think that they're going to go somewhere close to the border and they're going to get shot at. But no, it's very safe. There's not even a lot of people crossing the border. I've seen like about three people that have crossed the border, but they have not been a threat at all. People think that they're going to hurt you, but that is not the case. They're just human beings. They're people that just are seeking for a better life. It will be weeks before I see my family again. People, most notably my wife, wonder how I can be away from them for so long. In my mind, the answer is relatively straightforward. I have already been away from them for years. My absences were never in such long stretches, but for the last two decades, I spent about a third of my time on the road. Staying at my job meant another five years away from the family in a job that was no longer tolerable. This border walk is an attempt to reclaim my sanity and reorient my life and career in a direction that allows more family time. It isn't the way most people would pull themselves back together, but it might work for me. No one knows just how much is riding on this endeavor. If I fail, I may never believe in myself again. 9-11 gave it a label. You could say that you're enforcing the law against terrorism. So if you talk to DHS, talk to the Border Patrol, they'll say that's their number one priority. The reality is the sorts of operations that Customs and Border Protection, which includes the ports of entry and the Border Patrol, do are not really aimed at terrorism, hardly at all. What they really are aimed at is unauthorized Mexican and Central American migrants. That's what has happened since 93-94 and reinforced by or at least justified by 9-11 has been going after folks who want to chop up your vegetables so you can go out to a restaurant and that's where the money goes that's where the effort goes that's where the attention goes that's where the rhetoric goes we are on the far edges of west texas uh, we're bordered by culbertson county on the eastbound side we're bordered by mexico to the south to the north, we're bordered by New Mexico. We cover an area of about 2,900 square miles with two ambulances, one paramedic, and about four EMTs. Since I've been here, I can tell you that I have been personally on 20 calls with the United States Border Patrol um, with respect to illegal crossings, illegal immigrants, things of that nature. Um, most of those have been during the summertime with dehydrations, really, really, really sick people. There's more than Mexicans coming across this border. I know for a fact there's some Jordanians that have been across the border. There has some Saudi Arabians that have been across the border. There are Pakistanis. But the majority of what we see are of Hispanic nature. The border is wide open. The border is completely wide open. There are not enough agents and not enough hours in the day to secure that border. In respect to the terrain, it's very, very treacherous. And that's all the way throughout the entire county. We do have maintained roads, but there are some areas in this county that, for lack of a better term, I would take a goat cart down. There is more country in this area right here to hide in than you could ever imagine. And we would never know it. Why is our government not doing what they should be doing with respect to immigration and customs enforcement to help the people that are trying to come across or that have come across understand that what they're doing is wrong. Give them the guidelines what it takes to become an American citizen. 
or to get a visa or whatever the case may be. Just don't throw them back across the border and say bye-bye. They'll be back in 20 minutes. They know the pathways. These people want a better life. Minimum wage in Mexico right now is about 75 cents an hour, maybe, from what I'm understanding. These people have to live. They've got to eat. They've got families to take care of. I am a full-blown conservative, but I'm also a humanitarian. I personally believe that if an individual wants to come to the United States to better themselves, to better their families, to better their lives, I'm all for it. But please do it in the proper fashion. A crime is a crime, no matter where you're at. Do it legally. A lot of folks came through Ellis Island. A lot of folks did it the right way. Just do it the right way. I'm a former law enforcement officer as well. I was a police officer for about seven years. I'm a firm believer in the justice system. I'm also a firm believer in the protection of our country. I feel, along with several others in this community, it's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. We're in Huskook County, right off of 192. Uh, it's close to exit 87 and I-10, and we're standing by the Rio Grande. It's a footbridge that I'm assuming is something to do with the International Boundary Commission, but I couldn't tell you exactly who would really lay claim to it, but it don't make a lot of sense if Obama and everybody's saying the borders are safe and they got a footbridge right there, they can and do walk across regularly. Today, the Rio Grande is an obstacle to be traversed, but it made life feasible for the people who lived here thousands of years ago. The Native Americans were as connected to the environment as the modern American is disconnected from it, and their example gives me strength. Whatever path my career takes after this walk, I will always be a student of the plants, animals, and ecology of the world I hope to preserve. There's no question that Mexicans of whatever legal status come to be the iconic object of fear in this whole process. And that's why so much effort is put at the U.S.-Mexico border in spite of an objective analysis of risk saying that we really face you know, homegrown terrorists and we face uh, political terrorists moving through the international transportation system, airports and so forth. What we do face in the way of risks at this border is sophisticated criminal organizations rather than mass labor migrants. Even in terms of risks from Mexico, not all people are the same, but the icon is the unauthorized Mexican migrant. I was born and raised on a little cow outfit in eastern Oregon. I, I cowboyed until I was 19 and I went in the Marine Corps then for three years when the Korean War was going on, but they never did send me overseas. And then came back to Oregon and cowboyed until uh, I joined the Border Patrol in 60. My first station was at Tucson, Arizona for three years. And then I went to Sanderson, Texas for seven years, and then two years in Presidio, and then the last 10 years here in Van Horn. And I, when I retired, I had a home bought, and I just stayed here. We caught an awful lot of wet Mexicans. It wasn't very long until we were leading the sector with apprehension because there were lots of them here. The reason that the Mexicans come here is because they have a very low standard of living and tough conditions there because of their rotten government. And they come here for a job that most of the ones that, that we handled in my day were not mean scoundrels. Uh, the reason I said that I wasn't a wet Mexican is because I was born north of the Rio Bravo. And so I, I didn't have any animosity toward nearly all of them. I caught very few criminals. Of, of, I mean, all of them were criminals in as much as it's a felony to enter the United States without documentation. But 
They weren't the kind that you need to be afraid of. Partner and I were working an evening shift. We were down fairly close to the border here in the Big Bend, and we caught uh, an older man. I considered him older. He was probably in his 40s, but to me at that time, that was ancient, and a couple of 20-year-olds. And, and the older one said, uh, you all say it's a crime for me to enter the United States uh, without documentation. Is that right? And I said, yes, sir. That's what the law said. And he said, well, I don't understand that. He said, I have a wife and five kids in Mexico, and there's no job. And he said, I come up here, and these ranchers want me to go to work for them. And your own people are standing on the street corners and won't work. He said, why is it a crime for me to enter? And I said, well, Juan, I don't make these laws. I'm just enforcing them. I said, if I had my way about it, I might leave you here and ship some of those that are standing on the corner, but I'm not allowed to do that. And he said, well, I realize that. And he said, uh, well, I'll say one thing. When you all catch us, if we have any money, you put it in an envelope and give it back to us when we're released. And if we don't have any clothes, you hunt up clothes for us. And when we're put in jail, we're fed. In Mexico, they'll throw you in jail and won't even feed you. And I said, well, Juan, your laws are rotten in Mexico. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, no, sir, the laws are beautiful, but the people enforcing them are rotten. And I've thought of that many times. I hear this old semi-literate wet Mexican had a better handle on things than, than some people that are running the country. Politicians making uh, rules for uh, the international boundary is, uh, is crazy. They, most of them couldn't find the, the border on a map, let alone know anything about it. They don't come down and check the situation. They don't talk to people that are working or living on the border. They don't know anything about it and don't care. All they're concerned about is politics. If they can make a vote out of it, they would sacrifice the whole United States. And we need to, to revise our nationality laws that, because uh, as it's written now and has been for well over probably 150 years, is anyone born in the United States is an American citizen automatically. And, and that means that both parents might be illegal and, and it is a, a wreck in the making. A person should have to be born of legal residents, either citizens or lawfully immigrated aliens before they'd be an American citizen. And if we don't do that, we will be stuck with the, the hordes that we're getting. The fencing situation is, uh, is an exercise in futility. A few people make a fortune with an expensive contract building a big fancy fence that doesn't do any good. It doesn't take them but a few seconds to cross that fence. All it is is a marker and you could drag your toe and make a mark that would, wouldn't cost anything and it'd do just much good. In my 20 years as research coordinator for Longleaf Alliance, I spent a good amount of time helping landowners with extensive holdings to manage their property in ways that met their objectives and benefited the ecosystem. In my experience, no matter what their politics happen to be, they usually have hearts of conservation gold. My dad purchased this ranch in 1967, and he did it for the explicit purpose of preserving the unique geology and nature of the area. And over the years, uh, I came back in 1994 from Austin and started doing geology tours on the ranch. They have developed now into ecotourism, which is very big in the state of Texas. And uh, I take people out and show them the unique geology, and we hike the big canyons that have 20 and 25 foot deep water holes and they get to see sometimes, if they're not hiding, the bighorn sheep and the burros. And it's just an absolutely gorgeous place. It's so unusual. Uh, we have geologists and archaeologists that come out here, and they're all just so entranced by the beauty and the vastness of this uh, Precambrian sandstone, which the ranch is noted for. It's one of the largest Precambrian sandstone exposures in the North American hemisphere. Precambrian means 
before life. There are absolutely no fossils in any of the sandstone anywhere, which makes it very unique. And um, it's just flat pretty to look at. Every day is another adventure. You can drive the same road every day, but if you're five minutes different, you'll have a different sun angle, different cloud cover. The sun actually moves in the sky, and you have so many different things that you see as a reflection of, of the shadows and that type of thing that it's always something new. Being in a place like this will definitely lower your blood pressure. You will not need blood pressure pills if you come out here and stay. It is the quiet. Uh, some people find it overwhelming because there are no sounds, uh, no airplanes flying over, no people talking, no trains, no, no motor vehicles, anything like that out here. It's so peaceful and it's very uh, cleansing to your soul. It lets you have a commune with nature that you don't get anywhere else. And uh, the early creations in this Precambrian with no fossils in it makes you think about how long the earth has been here and how long this area has survived and what it's doing for us if we just learn to respect it and protect it. It's hard to imagine the beauty and scale of a place like this until you see it. Then the idea of erecting a border wall here seems both immoral and futile. A border wall is a very simplistic answer to a highly difficult and somewhat unnerving, complicated set of changes. It's not that we should just be in this incredible embrace of globalization. And it's also not that we can just simply wall ourselves off from it and reject it. So I think we should be engaged in a lot smarter dialogue right now inside the United States about how we want to be part of the world. There's been people living here on this land for at least 12,000 years, some say 14. And this place has been continuously farmed for around 2,000 years. My family's been here since the, the mid-60s. Uh, we farm uh, up and down along this river here for ever since that time, uh, mostly onions, cantaloupe, and honeydew until uh, about 20 years ago when we uh, had to shut those kind of operations down due to labor and water and some other issues. And now well, all we grow is alfalfa and a few forage crops uh, that we can harvest mechanically. What you see behind me is actually more water than is normal uh, for the last 15 years coming out of Mexico in the Rio Conchos. There's basically nothing coming out of the Rio Grande here, just to my left. From this point up to Fort Quitman towards El Paso, basically there is no Rio Grande River. They call it the Forgotten River. And the reason is there's no real channel. There's just a, a, a salt cedar forest, for lack of a better word, and, 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 and the channel doesn't really even exist. You can literally cross it with just by hopping over it wherever there is one. I've got a lot of friends on both sides of this border and from what I've seen there's plenty of laws on the books right now. Government or politicians uh, what they do is, is, they, is they'll make up a new law to say well we fix the problem when they're actually not fixing anything. You need to make a way for people to be able to come in, live and work here. It needs to be controlled it needs to be quicker, it needs to be easier, but you need to enforce the laws across the board that you have. When I grew up here as a youngster, uh, there was just a few Border Patrol here, just a few customs people. We were all friends, you know, we got together for barbecues and, and played poker and stuff together and this, that, and other. Now, you have so many agents and officers here that are not like the former people who came here, really liked the place, and are still here retired. Now you have guys come in here and, and they can't wait to get their two years of hardship duty out of the way and move somewhere else to a big city or just get out of here. And, and uh, they don't ever get, they don't ever take the time to really know the local people. And so you have this them against us kind of thing and, and uh, they don't understand us and we don't understand them. They talk about building a fence here. Well, 
I happen to know that the Border Patrol has two squads of people up in El Paso whose sole job every day is to go fix the holes uh, that, were, that were made the night before uh, in the fence that's already there. And they don't seem to be lacking anything to do. And you've got all this, all this, this hundreds and hundreds of miles of beautiful country you're going to build a fence on. They won't do a lick of good except spend a lot of money and, and make some people angry. It's make me angry. All this political stuff has, has made it to where you've kind of got this kind of us and them kind of thing. I remember when in, in the late 60s when I got here, this uh, was about 600 people in Presidio and maybe 8,000 over in Okinawa, with, including the Colonias. A whole lot more now, but back then this river was just a little bit of water you had to cross to go see your relatives or friends on the other side. A group of friends I dubbed the Tex-Mexican Padres supply logistical support for my walk. Their primary mission is to help me stay alive, but they also serve in other capacities. I like to think of this as my 10,000 mile handshake. I left East London, South Africa, traveled to Johannesburg, traveled to JFK, traveled to Charleston, South Carolina, traveled to Columbia, South Carolina, flew to El Paso, Texas, and drove who knows where the hell we drove in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and shook hands with Mark Haynes. And the main reason I came is I wanted to make sure that I wasn't the only crazy individual in the world and a guy's going to walk 1,200 miles on the Mexican border would top me out. <laughs> so we're going to wrap up our week as a support team. It's been one of the greatest adventures of our life. So for prophets, poets, philosophers and innovators and pioneers, this is the place you want to be. Most people of Mexican origin are not illegal immigrants, to use that phrase, or even necessarily immigrants. Mexicans have been inside the United States, what became the United States for a very long time, and have been coming across for a very long time. Nací en el Paradero, el municipio de Ojinaga. Nací el 47, el 27 de mayo. Pues me crié Anduve en muchas partes de México. En el 1965, más o menos andaba como en 13, 14 años, cuando anduve toda esa parte de ahí. Y como en los 60, 66, brinqué para acá, para Estados Unidos. Trabajos a veces en las cercas, a veces a caballo, con las vacas, vaquereando animal, las vacas, arreando vacas y, y toda mi vida es lo que ha he hecho más bien. Bueno, en, en los 1970, cuando yo entré a trabajar a la Joseda, ahorita es el Big Ben Range, sí ha cambiado bastante, bastante ha cambiado. En aquellos años, cuando estábamos estábamos todos ahí, ahí en la Jauceda. Uh, bueno, nosotros durábamos un mes, dos meses para venir a México a traer dinero para la familia, para que compraran comida y todo. Y durante algunos años tuvimos así, desde el 1970 hasta 1988. Fue cuando ya arreglé yo los papeles míos. Entonces, ya de ahí cambió, ha cambiado mucho, ha cambiado mucho, porque ya ahorita, en primer lugar, no se puede arrimar ni al río. Y en aquel en, en tiempo, pasábamos el río, cruzábamos como si fuera una sequía, una cosa muy natural. Y como, como dicen, ¿verdad?, que es natural, que toda la área es natural ahorita, pero yo creo que no. Ha cambiado mucho, mucho ha cambiado. No, ya ahorita es mucho, muy diferente. Lo que es la frontera, lo que es el río, como les dije ahorita anteriormente, en aquel tiempo, cuando nosotros cruzábamos, lo mismo era como si fuéramos cruzando una sequía. Y ahorita no se puede arrimar al, al orir el río, 
tanto por de este lado como por el lado de México. Ahorita hay muchos problemas, muchos problemas. Porque en que tenga sus papeles, tiene problemas. Igual por México. En que tenga, que sea mexicano y que ande por orilla el río. Como están las cosas ahorita entre las leyes, ahorita cambiaron mucho. Porque hay personas que lo cuidan a uno, que no cruce para este lado. O tiene que pagar para cruzar para este lado. Entonces, ahorita no hay seguridad ni aquí ni allá. Porque es una cosa mucho, muy triste. De los años anteriores, que uno no tenía papeles, cruzaba uno tanto de aquí para allá como de allá para acá. Uh, y se ayudaba a uno al cruzar para este lado, a Estados Unidos. Y ahorita es tanta la gente que hay, que ahorita casi la mera verdad tiene uno hasta miedo andar aquí por de este lado, o pa, para pasar para de aquel lado, andar por la frontera. Porque ahorita las cosas han cambiado mucho, mucho, mucho han cambiado. Y mucha gente no puede ni, ni cruzar para estar para México. Todavía aquí, aquí sí se vive más, más tranquilo, porque aquí todavía la ley sí, sí obra bien, sí lo ayudan a uno, pero por México no, 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 no se puede hacer nada. Pues la gente allá, como siempre he dicho, es que hay mucha ambición al, al dinero, mucho... Ha habido mucha hambre toda la vida en México. Y ya ahorita ya, ya no son la, los, los, la gente que hay en la frontera, no. Es, son gentes que vienen de mucho, muy lejos. Vienen caminando, caminan y caminan y caminan. Muchos pobres llegan aquí y, y muchos pueden pasar, muchos no. Muchos se quedan por lo río, el río muertos o... Unos de una cosa, unos enfermedades, otros los matan o, o no falta. Ya no hay seguridad de nada, de nada. Y qué bueno que me tocó suerte a mí arreglar con mi familia para acá. Porque quién sabe, estando en México no. No se puede vivir en México ahorita. Es puro fracaso, puro navegar con la gente. Ya... Por eso digo que yo vivo mejor. People keep asking me if I'm going to celebrate the holiday with my family. I tell them no. They're a thousand miles away. And besides, I need to walk another 20 plus miles today. But after subsisting mostly on granola and jerky for the last month, the Thanksgiving feast is a delicious indulgence. The reality is there's a huge amount of everyday intimate interaction. It needs to be emphasized that there are many different kinds of interchange. There's people with many different kinds of legal status. There's dual citizens, there's people who are U.S. citizens going over to Mexico, people who are Mexican citizens who are coming to the United States, who have local uh, border crossing cards. That's actually a much larger number of people going back and forth legally through the ports of entry than there is unauthorized migration. I was born in 1931 in Del Rio but purely because uh, Del Rio was the nearest doctor, we, and that was 60 miles away from the town of Langtree where we lived. And grew up in Langtree, uh, finally had to leave to go to college and was gone for 20 years, but managed to come back to Langtree in 1968 in order to help the state open the Judge Roy Bean Visitor Center. 
Of course, I also have ranched through the years. Uh, while I was running the visitor center, I had about 900 ewes on a ranch over on the Pecos River. And uh, today I'm a little too old for the ranching, but I keep a few goats. I like to have a little bit of stock around. Early Spanish explorers who ventured into the Trans-Pecos country uh, often called this the despoblado which, if I understand correctly, means a wasteland or uninhabitable land, for example. And, uh, of course, we've found that that's not actually the case. Uh, you have to adapt to survive in this country. You have to get used to solid rock everywhere and cactus and so forth. But uh, where there's a will, there's a way. We're sitting near the edge of Eagle Nest Canyon, which is just about a half a mile east of Langtree. Eagle Nest Canyon is amazing in the amount of Indian remains there. Uh, back around 4,000 years ago, the people that we now call the Pecos River people were living in these caves. In Eagle Nest Canyon, there are seven shelters that were occupied by the Indians. Uh, and uh, we're still learning a tremendous amount about these people. Many people say, well, we can't utilize it perhaps, but still, you know, we can understand how our forefathers and the folks who lived here uh, were able to survive in this desert country. In 1882, the railroad was being built and uh, at Langtree, there was a real good spring in a canyon about half a mile west of the town, and uh, that's the reason they established a town here, because the railroad put in a big pump there and pumped water out of the spring up to a tank, and of course they then were able to have adequate water for those little old steam engines they were using in 1883 and so forth. After the railroad was completed, Langtry was a small village, but uh, then it uh, grew as the railroad crews moved in to permanently maintain the tracks and so forth. And probably the peak population of Langtry was in the 1930s, around 300, maybe a few more. But then uh, the railroad bypassed the main part of Langtry in order to shorten their route. and. Uh, the town has continued to decline uh, ever since the 30s. A recent uh, newspaper man described Langtree in the fact that uh, Langtree has more historical markers today than it has uh, families. So that means Langtree is rapidly becoming a ghost town. Throughout the history of Langtree, there had been a close association with Mexico. For example, when I was a kid, my dad was a good friend of the landowner in Mexico, just across the river from where we lived. In those days, a deer had been killed out of this area, but in Mexico, they had not. And the rancher let us go over there and hunt deer. And we'd bring them across the river in a boat. Close relationship between us and the rancher on the Mexican side of the river. But then, uh, when 9-11 occurred, that completely changed our lifestyle all along the Rio Grande. Free access was halted immediately. Of course, we had had uh, Border Patrol and Customs officers all through the years, but they kind of looked the other way as far as people going back and forth across the river. So life along the border has changed immensely. I've often told my children that we can all be very thankful that we were born on this side of that muddy Rio Grande rather than on the south side of the river because life has certainly been much better to those folks born north of the Rio Grande and in the United States of America. Besides the expected aches and pains from my knees and back, my feet are a constant concern. Every morning I get up and spend a few minutes taping my toes. This ritual spares my feet from any major damage, but one of my Tex-Mex compadres isn't so lucky. 
I chose to walk with Mark today and we, we went 25 miles, which was less than I expected I would make, but after about halfway through, I didn't think I would finish, but I would recommend anybody take that 25 mile hike with Mark. Uh, if nothing else, just so you appreciate modern technology and the comforts of home. <laughs> now, the injuries were, were multiple, and uh, we won't get the total count till this evening when I take my shoes off, but I'm kind of scared to do that right now. There's not a lot of evidence that the, the fence wall uh, has anything more than a symbolic impact. It's just a giant symbol. One of the f first things about it, it was meant to kind of trick people into thinking that it was benevolent. It was built to look like it was not a giant, crude Berlin Wall type of concrete barrier, so they left a lot of open spaces. There's actually several different designs. There's ones with very closely set vertical poles, but with gaps between them. There's others that is this kind of um, very heavy version of a kind of a mesh. So you can look at it and say, oh, well, it's got holes in it. It must be a fence. But it is a wall. You know, I've been working on the, the issue of the wall since before it was built, since it was first announced in uh, immigration reform bills in 2006. Uh, and watched the walls go up, um, you know, watched these little pieces of walls hopscotch across South Texas, and really seen how much damage they've done and how little impact they've had on immigration or anything else that they're supposed to be doing. In 2006, you had competing House and Senate bills uh, that were supposed to deal with immigration reform more broadly, and they both had border walls included in the bills. And when they couldn't reconcile those bills, they just pulled the border walls out and passed that by itself. That was despite the fact that the GAO and congressional committees had already looked into border security, beefing up border patrol size and border walls for years and years. And they had always found that the only effect that those have is to reroute traffic. You don't get a stop, you don't get a decrease, you just have a different uh, entry point. Uh, but otherwise, the same number of people come through. And so, it's still passed Congress because it looks good, you know? If you are a member of Congress and you want to look tough on border security, you want to look tough on drug smuggling and terrorism and immigration, you can go shoot your campaign ad in front of a border wall. Broader immigration reform, you can't, you can't see it, you can't touch it. And so it doesn't work in a campaign ad. Department of Homeland Security was given the power to waive any law they wanted to. So in 2008, they waived uh, the Endangered Species Act, they waived the Clean Water Act, they waived the Farmland Policy Protection Act. These walls wouldn't be legal to build if they hadn't waived the laws. I mean, they're still not legal, they just don't have to worry about the law. When the Secure Fence Act was passed, they built 652 miles eventually. And that 652 miles on a 1900 mile southern border, it goes in fits and starts. And the claim is made that those brakes funnel traffic, that people have to go through those brakes and those brakes get better patrolled. Um, the reality is that each sector was assigned a mile count and that mile count was arbitrary. It was just about getting the total that, was, that they saw as required by Congress. And they didn't care where they went. And so in South Texas, you have walls that are either next to a port of entry, which makes a little bit of sense, uh, or next to a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge because you didn't have to sue anybody for that property. As I get further into the lower Rio Grande Valley, hundreds of law enforcement vehicles travel my route on a daily basis. Several of them stop to question my presence, 
And it makes me angry that our society has criminalized something as basic as walking. As a law-abiding citizen of this country, it's disturbing to feel as though I'm being constantly surveilled and marked as a possible homeland threat. Now what there is is people moving across the landscape, tromping across the landscape, and you don't always know who they are. In a big city, you're kind of used to not knowing who lots of people are, but in remote areas and rural areas, it's sort of a little bit stranger to have somebody just appear and walk across the landscape and you don't know who they are. When I find a dead body, uh, you have to call four people. You have to call the Border Patrol to kind of say, well, this guy is illegal. Two, you got to call the JP to verify that he is dead and probably more or less the cause. Then you got to uh, call the uh, Sheriff Department, which is his county. You know, he is responsible for dead people in his county. And um, the other person that you have to bring out here is a man with a bag, the mortuary man, to put him in there. Well, I've always uh, been concerned as far as securing the border. And this current administration has uh, uh, given everybody amnesty. So deportations have completely ceased. I think this current administration is just telling everybody, come on across. Lay around here for a couple of years and we'll give you amnesty. But then again, what else could the president do? Period. You know, what else can they do? And, and, and the Republicans or Democrats or whatever, they're not going to go against that. They can't. If they do, they lose the Mexican vote. Very simple. We're at a site where these illegals that uh, have walked approximately 35 miles. This is where they kind of relieve themselves of any kind of extra baggage because this is their final destination, which is Highway 285 right north of here. And <clears throat> they take off all the unnecessary clothes. They get rid of all these water bottles because they're waiting for the next coyote to pick them up which is going to take them to Houston. And they have to make a dash from here to the highway, which is about 75 yards at night. And they all have to fit in one unit. And if they're 15 or 20, they really have to kind of undress and uh, don't carry any extra baggage for them to all to fit in that one unit, which will take them all to Houston, Texas. 60% of these people that come across that get apprehended come from Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala. 40% come from Mexico. And that's the same as far as picking up the dead ones, from what I know. I, in my past 24 years here, I picked up about 25 bodies. I picked up six just on this trail right here. And there's, a, I think year before last, there was a record, there was 130 that were found in Brooks County alone. So that 130 is only a 10 or 15% of the ones that you really, that, are, that have really died out of. That's the only ones you find, and you're lucky to find those. So there, for sure there was about 250 that died in Brooks County. You, you go through the pity and the compassion and stuff, and you know, that's somebody's uh, kin or nephew or kid or daughter or somebody died up here and it's, it's sad that uh, you know they probably never will find out uh, who she is or whatever. This is the first one of this particular kind that has ever been put in yeah. South Texas. Probably in Texas period. And the reason it's good, it's portable, because you can move it to where you know that the trail is hot and then where they're gonna go through. It was placed here because I know that uh, that trail we traveled on is very hotly used. And the reason it's hotly used, it, uh, it goes straight to that their final destination up here on Highway 285 where they're gonna be picked up. But the reason it's put here is because it's two miles from that particular final 
location where they're going to arrive, and I know that the people are thirsty. And uh, six of them have died on this uh, trail, and that's the reason I put it here, trying to save their lives. I think lots of people in the United States don't realize that there's a whole network of checkpoints inside the U.S.-Mexico border on almost all the main roads. This is a second border where the courts have allowed the Border Patrol to have suspicionless searches and questioning. So it's like a border. It's like going through an international border, only it's deep into the United States. It's many miles into the U.S. The shift uh, in terms of the migrant traffic has come into South Texas. Brooks County is almost a thousand square miles. It has a federal immigration checkpoint and all the migrant border crossers are, make every attempt to circumvent that. So everything that, uh, in, in, that has, in, involves of migration and globalization is happening here in Brooks County. They, they're dealing with the consequences of all of this. They're dealing with deaths. This is a, a continued part of the mass disaster that, in, that encompasses the entire border. Our number one mission is to end the deaths and to prevent the suffering of, of, uh, of migrant border crossers and their families. We're undertaking that effort through a water station project, talking to the private ranchers, putting out water stations to, as humanitarian aid to migrant border crossers. Most people die of dehydration. So water is essential. Water is, um, is first aid. And so we be began the task in reaching out to the community here, the ranch community, to place water in those ranches where people have died and to prevent people from dying. There's a lot of factors that, that causes migration, and migration is something that is a natural phenomenon worldwide. There's 232 million people that are in constant motion in this world. People come through here, various reasons they leave their country for violence, corruption, uh, no, no, no civic control, uh, police operating with impunity. So people are, are going to leave where they can better themselves. And that's the case that's happening right now. Mexico is right there, our next door neighbor. And that it's the same problems that exist in Central American countries exist for Mexico. And it's just right here. And, and, and it's just how, how are you gonna relate to that migration flow? And how, you, how can you regularize that in a way that's fair, humane, and just? This country also has an insatiable appetite for labor. Corporate America needs labor. It is proven by having 11 and a half million people that are already here working, being part of the economic equation. Even though we need workers, under what conditions is this country going to accept workers? You, you accept them with rights and some privileges, or you, ex you maintain them in the shadows, invisible, with no rights, and, and in fear of their lives in terms of being disrupted by the fact that they don't have the proper documentation. All those things, you know, don't make sense. They don't make sense for uh, a country that is a country of freedom, a country, you know, that says, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who does that apply to? After walking 1,010 miles along the border, I realized that the concerns of the people here are similar to those of people anywhere. We all want to be treated fairly, whatever color our skin may be. We want to remain relevant as we grow old, even as the rate of change in the world accelerates and threatens to leave us behind. We want to feel safe and secure in our own country, while providing opportunities for those who happen not to have been born here. We want a chance at a better life, just like anyone who's ever immigrated to this country from anywhere. How do we balance border security and immigration justice? The chorus of voices I heard along the way provided many insights, but no clear answer to that question. The only conclusion I can draw is that La Frontera divides two countries, but unites two cultures. This expedition met and exceeded my personal objectives. I tested myself physically and mentally. I got away from the anxieties and frustrations that were plaguing me. 
I changed my life's direction by overcoming the inertia holding me back from other more rewarding paths. But what the walk really did was reveal the amazing character and humanity of those who call the border their home. And in telling their story, perhaps I will have accomplished something bigger than I ever intended. My appetite for adventure is not sated. The relief I felt on Boca Chica Beach was temporary. The trail is calling. <laughs>